This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 11th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why a statewide sales tax is simply another top 20% effort at pushing costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Second, why the Saudi Aramco IPO, initial public offering, is significant to Alaskans. And third, why the disclosure of Hillcorp's financials is appropriate as part of the state's review of its proposed acquisition of BP's Alaska assets. And now, let's join Michael. Well, this story from the Midnight Sun, I had to chuckle because as much as, uh, you know, it seems like Matt Buxton has finally shed most of his newsman skin and uh, is really not pulling any punches uh, in his articles uh, these days. Uh, he had his uh, Friday in the Sun here this last weekend where he went over a handful of things, but what caught your eye was really kind of the whole thing at the very end where it started talking about, uh, started talking about revenues uh, and the potential for a sales tax. Tell us uh, what your thoughts were on this whole uh, piece and article that's in the uh, Midnight Sun. Well, the... the this this portion of his mid of his Friday in the Sun uh, regular column uh, it was focused on uh, a uh, a focus group effort that had gone on up in Fairbanks that some people think uh, was coming from the governor or those who support the governor uh, and they were testing various the the focus they were testing various approaches on the focus group uh, one was uh, a change in the PFD from the current statutory PFD to a 50-50 POMV, 50-50 along the lines that Shelley Hughes uh, has endorsed. Uh, but the second thing that they were testing with the focus group is how is how that focus group, how Alaskans would respond to uh, uh, sales taxes. Um, and Matt uh, extrapolated, thinking that that is what the governor's proposing, Matt extrapolated from that and said, well, the administration uh, must be considering uh, uh, using sales taxes, uh, and then and then he went on to say, well, that's the that's the conservative, uh, the conservative approach. So conservatives seem to favor sales taxes, and that's that's what caught my eye. Sales taxes uh, are are not uh, uh, a conservative approach. Basically, they're a top twenty percent uh, approach. What sales? All taxes are income taxes. That's what. That's what we pay taxes from. We pay we pay it from income, and different tax designs are 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 designed to get at different taxpayers, different classes of taxpayers, or different types of income. A PFD tax, for example, or PFD cuts, uh, are intended to get at um, uh, PFD income and leave all other income uh, out of the equation. A sales tax is designed to get at income that's used to buy goods and services the the portion of your income that buys goods and services but what it leaves out and when you and when you do tax analysis you you are as focused on what's left out of the tax as what's in the tax what it leaves out is the portion of your income that's used for investment or savings or purchases outside uh, of of the state um, and 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 when you design taxes that way what you're really doing is benefiting the top 20% who have a hot higher percent of their income is devoted to or that's used for investment or for uh, savings or for purchases outside the state than, than the remaining 80%, than, than, than middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. That's why you would use a sales tax because you're trying to soften the tax blow 
um, on the top 20%. So Matt's, I mean, Matt's claim that it's the conservative approach is wrong. It's the top 20% approach. And, and top 20% are sometimes conservative, sometimes they're not uh, in their other politics, but they're always protecting themselves, uh, it seems. And, and that's really what's going on uh, when one's talking about sales tax. It's not, it's not trying to get a conservative tax uh, or a liberal tax. It's trying to get a tax that protects a certain income class, and that certain income class is the top 20%. It was interesting to see how they the reaction to both the discussion on the taxes and kind of the tone that he took uh, about this softening over a 50-50 POMV. Uh, it was kind of this um, – it was very dismissive in the tone that he used. I'm just looking for the uh, thing right here, uh, talking about – uh, the tipster laid out a potential to recalculate the payout from the permanent fund to a 50-50 split between state services and the dividend, which would conveniently align with some recent softening we'd seen from hardline PFDers in favor of a compromise on the dividend. Now, the, the problem is we've had conversations here with Shelley Hughes. We've had conversations, you and I, about this, that this is kind of the olive branch to see if the other side would shift. And they're still kind of treating these ideas with disdain. This is kind of the whole... Uh, I mean, Buxton is really kind of embodying the whole problem with what's going on in the legislature right now. He is. I mean, it's it's the it's the easiest thing. P, taking the PFD is the easiest thing for legislators. They don't have to involve the governor because if they don't appropriate, the governor has has no role to play. So it's sort of their little money pile that they get that they get to play with. Um, and they really and, and and they've they've latched on to it the last four years. The, where we're headed right now seems to be that they'll latch on to it for a fifth year. And they really don't want others uh, getting involved in that game. They really just sort of they like having that money pile. They like being able to, to, to deal with it themselves. Um, they don't mind uh, since since most of the legislators are in the top 20 percent themselves. Um, uh, they're not really that concerned about what happens to middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and so it's, it's, it, it, that's the, that's the money pile they want to keep playing with. Um, and, and they are dismissive of, of proposals to try to resolve this issue, uh, in a way that preserves a significant part uh, of the PFD. Do you think that, uh, you know, the, this, uh, this discussion now on this 4.5% sales tax, uh, or any form of new taxes that we're, you know, really kind of talking about here. But I think you're you're pointing out ideally that, you know, this whole thing has been the top 20 percent has been reticent to make any changes to change it from the business as usual. Do you think this message is starting to resonate at all, or are people just kind of head in the sand on this? I mean, we're coming into this next election cycle, and we're stuck in the same morass that we've been stuck in for the last four years. And I don't know yet as if people are really getting the point to say, A, that the PFD taking is a tax already, that it is the lower you know, income brackets that are being taxed. And these other ideas that are being floated are also kind of, again, on that lower 70, 80 percent of the income brackets. Are people starting to get it or are we still not getting the message out there enough to say, hey, pay attention, uh, you know, all these people in the upper income brackets are trying to lay the burden on your shoulders? Michael, I don't. I, I we are we are making some inroads. Um, it's probably a better question for Senator Shower tomorrow than it is for me. I mean, we're making some inroads. I don't. You don't. You don't see it out in the broad media, though. You don't see articles, except for one article by Nat Hertz back in 2017. You don't see articles out in the media that talk about the distributional impact of various of various approaches, various revenue approaches. You don't see articles that talk about a concern for middle and lower income Alaska families or that 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 the that the approaches that are being talked about are benefiting the top 20 percent there was the one article by Nat Hertz back in 2017 that did that uh, and occasionally you'll see James Brooks sort of hint at that uh, but but by and large you don't see you don't see that discussion and the reason is that legislators aren't discussing it um, uh, certainly, Natasha and 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 others in in some parts of Senate Finance aren't discussing it, uh, but frankly, I haven't seen Mike uh, discuss it a lot, uh, or Shelley discuss it a lot. Um, and I think I think you know, it, it, as long as the legislators aren't discussing it, it's it's going to be difficult for 
uh, for the media to uh, to pick up on it, or or it's going to be it, it's not going to be um, something that they will pick up on because they're largely driven by by what legislators are talking about. So uh, the answer is the answer is in some forums there's a concern about it, but it's not broad based. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. So, Brad, maybe the answer here is to, again, uh, you know, tomorrow when we have Mike Shower on, uh, we're taking a look at it when we're talking with our legislators on a one-to-one basis. Maybe we need to be pushing back and saying this is the direction that we need to take. I think what the problem is is messaging. We, we need a unifying message. The other side has been very good about keeping their messaging kind of unified and together. We need to be pushing back in that direction. Would you disagree? Yeah, no, I I think that's right. But here's here's the problem on 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 this side. I, Senator Shower and others just don't want to talk about taxes uh, at, at all. They want to keep up the mantra of cuts only that we're gonna that we need to cut our way out of this, or we're not going to talk about taxes until we get spending down. Various various forms of that, and so they don't want to talk about uh, 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 revenue issues because they want to keep the focus on cuts. That's understandable, but it's not working. I mean, we're 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 facing billion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see uh based on current revenues. And as much as we want to talk about, you know, cuts closing that billion dollars, it it hasn't happened the last 7 years and it's not going to happen based upon what happened last legislature when the governor couldn't even get 16 legislators to back him up. On, on his cuts only approach, it's not going to happen over the next decade. So, so it's really, to some degree, uh, our side uh, is sort of abdicating the field, leaving the field to to the to, to those who talk about who, who are willing to talk about revenues because because we don't want to talk about that. We need to. I mean, our side needs to step up and say, yes, uh, uh, we're going to have to talk about revenues. We've had new revenues the last. Four years in terms of PFD taxes, PFD cuts, um, and and yes, we're going to have to talk about new revenues. Now let's talk about what is a conservative way to raise new res- revenues, or let's let's talk about ways that we raise revenues that act as an incentive to get spending down, which is which is what a flat tax does. Um, but until until you know our side is ready to talk about revenues um <laughs> it, it we're sort of leaving the field to uh to natasha and 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 others uh, somebody sent me a, a, another piece here recently um and i was looking at it yesterday but i can't find where it was it was just i got too many ways for people too many channels for people to to talk to me through and i can't find the exact who it was and and the article that they were referencing but uh, I thought it would be a good segue here during the commercial break to talk about. Um, he was talking specifically about how um, the the idea of a of an income tax, even a flat tax, misses the boat on a lot of people who are um, you know who who make the majority of their money, and we're talking now about maybe the top one or two percent who make the majority of their money from. Uh, investments and and you know real estate and things like that. How the idea that a flat tax would hit even those folks uh, that we that they miss a whole portion up there at the top. And I know you've you've talked a little bit about this in the past with your idea of a flat tax having an AGI adjusted gross income component that does even get some of that more passive income in, in the top. So I thought I'd give you a chance to kind of address that as a sidebar here. Yeah. Um, so, what what that discussion is about is is appreciating assets. Um, an income tax, the the, the U.S. Uh, income tax uh, and adjusted gross income is a step in that process. Uh, does not tax and does not does not view as 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 income appreciation appreciation on investment assets. So if you own uh, a piece of property or a stock that's worth a hundred, uh, and the and the value of that stock goes to or asset goes to 150, uh, you're not taxed on that 50 until you cash it out, um, and and so uh, those who own appreciating assets uh, uh, don't uh, aren't taxed on on the value of that appreciation, and and because. Um, there was a 
there was an article over the weekend in either Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal that 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 pointed out that uh, most most stocks are owned by those in the top 20 percent because stocks or or assets of that type appreciating assets are owned mostly by those in the top 20 percent uh, it misses that that share of income that's right I mean you you don't get at that income but to get at that income uh, you would have to Alaska or any state that's trying to get at that income uh, would have to <coughs> excuse me would have to design its own tax system would have to it would have to adopt its own definition of of income uh, to be able to get at it. Um, it, it. There's a lot of discussion right now uh, in the national in the in the presidential primary on the on the Democrat side about mark to market and ways to get at that sort of income um, but that's that, that's going to be extremely difficult it's going to be a, it's going to be a lot of discussion and if we tried to a lot of effort and if we tried to do that in Alaska we'd have to sort of we'd have to sort of recreate that whole debate and figure out how we were going to get at that income the fact we don't get at that income the fact that yes there is there is sort of that that appreciation income that's out there that's not subject to a subject to the current U.S. income tax. The fact that it's out there, though, is not a reason just to give up and say, oh, we ought to use PFD cuts instead, or we ought to use a sales tax instead, because clearly those two are targeting middle and lower income Alaska families. So using adjusted gross income uh, may not get all of the income at the, at the top end, but it certainly gets a significant share of it. Uh, it gets the same share that the that the federal tax system is getting, includes it in the in the base tax, the tax base uh, that the that the federal tax system is is getting it, and does a much better job of of of, of at least getting that that top end income uh, than uh, than sales taxes or or PFD cuts. I guess I guess the way to say it is it's not perfect. Using adjusted gross income isn't perfect. In the sense of getting everybody's uh, get, getting that appreciation income, uh, but it's a heck of a lot better than using uh, uh, PFD cuts, which clearly are targeted at middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, or a sales tax, which essentially has the has the same effect. Um, with less than a minute here, but Christine says in the chat room, this smacks of class warfare rhetoric. I think talking about us talking about the top twenty percent. I'm not for taxing the rich nor the poor. No taxation. We have a spending problem, not a money problem. And and I guess my que- my comment is, you know, why can't we multitask on this? We need to do both. What, your thoughts quickly here? Well, it 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 is. I mean, we we do have class warfare. Is the top twenty percent trying to come up with tax systems that tax middle and lower income Alaska families? That's clearly what PFD cuts are. I understand those who say cuts only, but we failed at cuts only. And if we don't recognize that. Uh, we're going to continue down this road of continued PFD cuts. We're going to continue down the road of focusing uh, the, the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. It's time to, to get in reality okay. uh, and recognize where we are. And I know it seems like we may be beating a dead horse, but I think that there's listeners out there like Christine who keep kind of saying the same things. And, and I guess we need to keep saying the same things back. She says PFD cuts uh, are more agreeable to me than depriving other individuals of their hard-earned money. Two wrongs don't make a right. And this is, again, in regards to the, uh, you know, I'm not for taxing anybody. We have a spending problem, not a money problem. We need to cut kind of idea. And and the problem is, and again, this is my comment before I let Brad get into it. The problem is, of course, we've been trying that. I've been, we've been, I've been trying to push that idea for going on 20 years now with this program. And yet here's where we end up. And even when we have a strongest you know, administration that could possibly push us forward with Dunleavy, even he couldn't reach all the way in, but even that couldn't get done. So, I mean, how realistic is that? And here, and here's the point, Michael. I mean, her comment about I'd prefer PFT taxes over other taxes. PFT cuts have the, quote, largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families. Why would you prefer... A, a system that has the largest adverse impact. This is ICER. This isn't Brad Keithley. This is ICER. Largest adverse impact on the overall economy. What, why would you prefer that? Because if you're in the top 20%, it benefits you. But it adversely affects the overall Alaska economy. Adversely affect is the, is the costliest measure 
for for middle and lower income Alaska families. I understand why if you're in the top 20%, you want that approach. I get it. It it saves you from having to having to contribute. But from the standpoint of the overall economy and all Alaskans, PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact. They are the worst approach uh, you can take. We can do better than that. We can find revenue measures that are better than that, more broad-based, lower impact on the overall economy. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And I think Jonathan nails it here as well. He says, <clears throat> first and foremost, the PFD cuts are absolutely a tax. And second, if our only response is to cut spending, we will lose control of the narrative indefinitely. And I think that's where we've been at thus far. If all we focus on is the cut, and I'm not saying we stop focusing on cuts. And I don't think Brad, I don't think Brad's saying that either. Uh, I mean, are you, Brad? You're not saying stop focusing on the cuts. No, a flat tax increases focus on the cuts. Right now, with PFD cuts only, the top 20% doesn't care. They don't feel they're the not, pain. They're right. not impacted. Yeah, they don't feel the pain at all. The only way to bring the pain home to them is to put that taxation into their pocket as well as the lower you know, 50 60% of income earners in the state. That's the only way to do it. And otherwise, we do lose control of the narrative, and, and that's the thing. You know, and we've lost control for the last four years. I mean, that's that's why we've had PFD cuts the last four years. This this is we, we are in a discussion about what's the best way to raise revenue. I mean, some people don't like it, but we are And the top 20 top 20 percent keeps saying not on us. Let's use another form. Let's use PFD cuts. Let's use sales taxes. It dodges us. We need to be talking about what's the right way to, to, to raise that revenue, what has the lowest impact on the economy, and what's the fairest, most equitable for Alaska families. <clears throat> and Christine says, I'm saying I would rather suffer the wrong herself than have us all suffer the wrong. She says she's not rich, she just has morals. I mean, again, this is not where I'm not saying nobody likes taxation. I mean, I'm we're not saying we're embracing taxation. The idea here is if you don't try and control and push this narrative, they're just going to run you over and do it anyway. And what'll happen is they'll take the PFD this year and next year and maybe 2 years from now, 3 years from now the PFD will pretty much be gone and then they'll be looking at other forms of taxes anyway. So why not short circuit this process and get everybody involved so that the top 20 percent feel the pain and maybe get the woe back switch thrown? Maybe their constituency and their donor group will go, wait a second, wait a second. Now you're talking about taxing me. That 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 doesn't that doesn't feel good. Uh, you know, I, again, this is not a moral issue. This is an issue of how do we win this battle right here? Well, and to the extent it is a moral issue, I, okay, so Christine wants 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 to, to pay a tax. Good for her. But why should we adopt the form that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and is by far the costliest to Alaska families? What, why should we do that? Why should we go down that road? Christine, I mean, she can pay more taxes if she wants to, but why adopt a methodology that has the large, largest <clears throat> adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy? Well, and as far as having a moral, a moral center, that argument seems to be the weakest because, again, you're adversing, adversing, <laughs> adversely affecting the largest significant gap of Alaskans right there. That's it right there. Let's move on to uh, number two in our weekly top three. Number two uh, deals specifically with something that's happening well across the horizon, and that is the Saudi Aramco IPO. Now, why should people in Alaska care about what's going on with the IPO of a Saudi oil company in the future? What is it bringing to the table? Well, so the Saudi IPO is a huge, um, uh, the Aramco IPO, initial public offering, stock offering in, in Aramco, is is a huge deal. Saudi, Aramco is the biggest oil company in the world by far. Uh, they've been privately held, if you will, by the Saudi government. They've not been, um, there's not been shares, public shares available in it. Uh, so this is a big stock market deal. The fact that, that the biggest company, oil company in the world, is offering uh, is offering shares in itself, um, and, and, but it's also a big oil deal because uh, when you become a public company, you've got to publish a lot of data, a lot of information uh, about yourself uh, and about the markets in which you in which you operate, and and Saudi uh, in, in in the IPO um, has a, a large segment of it devoted to the market in which 
Saudi Aramco is going to operate, the world oil market. And as a result of that, they have to talk a lot about what the future world oil market looks like uh, and what their place in it is. So they're, 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 they're describing, this is one of the few times you really get uh, one of the OPEC countries uh, really opening up about not only their uh, uh, production and, and their cost structure, uh, but also what their view is of the world oil market. Saudi included in its IPO analysis done uh, by uh, Chess Market, which, which used to be Cambridge Energy Advisors. Um, and it's a, it's a great insight into, into where at least they think oil markets are going. And it's, and it's an interesting insight. Uh, they talk about uh, peak oil. Peak oil demand, uh, when that's going to occur, and and the and the 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 what happens after we hit peak oil demand, um, and they talk about what the Saudi role, what they believe the Saudi oil role is in that post-peak oil uh, demand world, and and that really uh, uh, has a lot of of implications for all the other oil producing regions, uh, including Alaska. And before uh, we, we're going to continue this here in just a second, before we go any further, though, peak oil uh, for some listeners may mean something different than what you're talking about. You're talking about the peak demand, not the not the peak exploration in oil declining around the world like we're we have no more oil to produce. But you're talking about the peak demand for oil and that the slide now going down on the other side as other energy sectors come online. Right. Yes, exactly. Peak oil demand or peak demand for oil. Uh, uh, is is what the focus is on, not not peak production. Okay. We were in number two talking about the Saudi Aramco deal and the fact that Aramco is now finally acknowledging some of these uh, prospectus, uh, you know, uh, ideas and some of these, uh, you know, peak oil discussions, which heretofore they have pretty much said uh, are nonsense and don't make any sense. All of a sudden, They've gotten a little more realistic now that the IPO is about ready to start. What does this spell for Alaskans moving forward, Brad? Well, they've gotten realistic because when you when you uh, publish a, a prospectus, uh, uh, you're subject to legal liability if you if you don't tell what you know to be the truth. Right. Um, uh, in the prospectus, so people tend to get you, you tend to find differences between. Uh, statements that are that are in SEC documents and statements that sometimes are made uh, off the cuff out in the open market. Here, here's what um, uh, here's what was in the prospectus. Aramco used this is quoting from a Bloomberg article. Aramco used a forecast from industry consultant IHS Market that forecasts oil demand to peak around 2035. Oil demand to peak around 2035. Under that scenario, demand growth for crude and other oil liquids will be leveling off at that time. In an accompanying chart, the Saudi oil giant showed global oil demand lower in 2045 uh, than in 2040. So it's showing building up to a plateau around 2035, and then and then sort of coming off that plateau in uh, in in 20 uh, 2040 and, and 2045. Uh, he, that that has two meanings for Alaska. One is as we think about our future. Which we which we should be uh, as we go through this fiscal situation, um, oil may not always be strong in our future, and we need to think about our economy and what our economy is going to be like uh, as oil demand uh, levels off. The other point that Saudi makes, which in in the IPO, which I think is a very important one, Saudi says they're going to be fine. Uh, yes, we're going to have peak oil demand. Uh, in 2035, we're going to have a plateau and then we're going to come off. But we, Saudi, are going to be fine because we have the lowest cost production in the world. So as long as there's oil demand, we'll be filling, we'll be the sort of the first in to fill that. Uh, uh, the ones that the ones that should worry, basically what Saudi is saying, the ones that should worry are the ones that have high marginal costs. Uh, they'll be, those those sources of supply will be among the first sources of supply that will be knocked off. Prices will be lower, uh, but Saudi says our market share uh, will be bigger as a result of these marginal uh, uh, cost uh, uh, projects going away. The reason, the reason this is relevant to Alaska is we're one of the highest cost regions. Um, and, and looking at ourselves 
uh, we should be concerned about our cost structure and we should be concerned about where we fit in that in that plateauing oil demand uh, uh, environment. And we should be concerned about things that add to our costs and, and making us even more marginal. That comes back, frankly, to the oil tax debate uh, that, that we will be having uh, in, the, in the coming months uh, and concern about whether raising oil taxes is, in fact, just shoving our marginal cost higher and making us even more, as a, as a, as a region, exposed to uh, the type of market forces that, that Saudi's talking about in the IPO. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a big uh, uh, document, a big issue from the standpoint of the global oil market, uh, but it also has some some real significance uh, to Alaska. And those who want to understand uh, Alaska's position in the in the global oil market and understand the global oil market would do well to fo follow the Saudi I IPO and and the type of investor reaction and the type of comments uh, that are going on once Saudi once that Saudi stock uh, hits the market, because that's going to be a good reflection of what's going on in the in the broader. Uh, oil investment industry. And again, this shows kind of in some ways, uh, it's a reminder that we need to put people into the legislature that take this more long view, this 15 and 20 year view, rather than a 24 month view, which seems to be the typical uh, a time frame for, for this right now uh, in the state legislature. Um, yep, ex exactly right. Yep. Let's uh, talk about number three here. We're down to the last five minutes or so. Uh, number three on our weekly top three, uh, we're now going to be talking about the Hillcorp deal, which uh, the Hillcorp deal for the acquisition of BP has hit the papers. And one of the big uh, the big questions is, uh, should their financials over the last couple of years be put out in public? They say no, because they say it could hurt their competitiveness. You say no, we probably may need to see that if they want to take in a bigger chunk of, uh, of working the Alaskan economy. Yeah, here's here's the deal with this issue. I, I understand where Hillcorp's coming from. Hillcorp's a private company. They've taken they've gone to great pains to remain a private company. Um, and they do that in part to keep their financials private um, and, and to keep those out of public view. They don't have excuse me. They don't have SEC filings uh, in the same way we were just talking about with Saudi. So they don't have to make the statements. They don't have to make the disclosures, uh, and they and they really don't want to have to back into that for a part, at least a part of their business um, in in Alaska. So I, I understand what where Hillcorp's coming from, but here's the problem: Prudo and Taps. And remember that Hillcorp is buying 49% of Taps as as a result. Trans Alaska Pipeline System is a part of this acquisition. Prudo and Taps are sort of the core. Of, of the Alaska economy, Alaska's f fiscal structure, um, and, and sort of the core of how, of how Alaska operates, at least right now. Um, if, if we were talking about you know, the Cook Inlet properties, acquisition of Cook Inlet properties, as Hillcorp's done in the past, or the acquisition of, of not insignificant, but not hugely central properties up on the North Slope, as they did with Milne uh, and the Liberty Projects, uh, and, and other projects on the North Slope. If if we were talking about those, then okay, there's sort of a balance there. We don't want to we don't want to put Hillcorp uh, Hillcorp's financial. We don't need to put Hillcorp's financials on uh, on on display on 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 public view uh, because those are sort of marginal proper properties and on balance it's okay. But now we're talking about central key core uh, properties uh, to to how Alaska operates. In Alaska's fiscal condition, and I think it's I think it's a different standard. I think when you're talking about those core properties, particularly when you're talking about TAPS, um, the acquisition of of, of a 49% interest in TAPS, um, but also with the the Prudhoe oil field, which is still at the core of Alaska production, I, I think it's a different issue. I think I think the the scrutiny that that they need to undergo because they're acquiring those key issues or those key projects, those key assets. Um, uh, is is different and and is a much higher higher level of scrutiny than 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 the marginal properties. And so I have a lot of a lot of sympathy for and and frankly, if it were me making the judgment, I would agree that 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 Hillcorp's financials play a different role, a much more important role, and a and a, and should be a much more public role uh, than they have been uh, in in the past and to this point.
And you think that they, I mean they should they should accept that risk uh, at this point to become the larger player in Alaska? Yeah, I think it's I think that's part of the deal. I, you get a large asset. Uh, you get you get a, a key asset in the form of the pipeline. You get 49 percent uh, in the pipeline, but that comes with certain costs, uh, and those costs aren't just money. Those costs are those costs are the level of public scrutiny and public disclosure uh, that uh, that you have to undertake. The laws, I mean, where this is really coming out at the moment is in the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, which has jurisdiction over the acquisition of BP's interests in TAPS. Uh, the law provides that that information should be public. Uh, and what Hillcorp is trying to do is to get an exception to that to that law to say, oh, no, we, we need to keep our information confidential because of competitive concerns. And the law recognizes under certain circumstances you can make you can make that exception. But but as, as I'm saying, I think it's a different balance um, when you're talking about when you're talking about these core assets, assets that are at the core of the Alaska economy, uh, as opposed to marginal assets. My point is that there's a, there should be a different standard apply, applied when you're talking about core assets than when you're talking about marginal assets. Those defending Hillcorp saying, well, you didn't ask when they acquired Milne, you didn't ask when they acquired the Cook Inlet, you didn't ask when they acquired Liberty or Endicott or any of the other assets. No, on balance, it sort of made sense to, to, to allow Hillcorp to remain uh, uh, to, to remain in a, in sort of a private mode, um, and and I'm not I'm not suggesting that they have to bear everything, but Alaskans have a right uh, have a have a need uh, and a right to feel comfortable that our core assets are are going to be transferred to somebody that has has a good solid financial position that we're not that we're not transferring them to someone that's on shaky ground and. Uh, and I'm not suggesting Hillcorp is, but I'm suggesting Alaskans have a right to evaluate that. Brad, thank you so much. I appreciate it uh, for joining us for this train wreck this morning. We appreciate you coming in and being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.